And we're talking about some pretty heavy stuff. Ecological collapse, solar flares, AI taking over. It's like the whole end of the world as we know it starter pack. I can see why you might be feeling a bit apprehensive. You've definitely been diving deep into some, let's say, uncomfortable possibilities. Uncomfortable is putting it mildly. Yeah. But also kind of fascinating. You know, like we always hear about these things separately, but you've got me thinking, what if they all happen at once? And that's exactly the kind of what if scenario a lot of these sources are exploring. This idea of a perfect storm where multiple crises converge and push our systems to the breaking point. It's not just one threat, but the combined effect that makes things feel so precarious. Okay, so instead of just worrying about climate change, we also have to worry about AI going rogue Andy the Sun, deciding to unleash a civilization-ending solar flare. Well, you're not wrong to connect those dots. Many of the sources highlight that interconnectedness. They argue that we can't look at these threats in isolation. Like climate change messes with our food supply, yeah. which could lead to unrest and conflict, mm -hmm. which might make us more vulnerable to, I don't know, some evil AI overlord taking advantage of the chaos. Exactly. It's a domino effect. And understanding that interconnectedness is key to building resilience, which is a recurring theme in these sources. Okay, so less doomsday prepping and more understanding the problems so we can find solutions. Exactly. And to do that, we need to break down the individual threats. Where do you want to start? Let's start with the one that's already knocking on our door. Climate change. I mean, we're already seeing the effects, but some of these sources make it sound like things are even worse than we realize. Right, and it goes beyond just rising sea levels and extreme weather. These sources connect climate change to things like mass extinction and the collapse of entire ecosystems. And that's bad because... Because those ecosystems are what keep the planet habitable for humans. Losing biodiversity disrupts natural cycles, weakens our food systems, and makes us more susceptible to disease. Okay, so it's not just about saving the polar bears, it's about saving ourselves. Exactly. And on top of that, some of your sources also delve into the potential risks of things like synthetic DNA and gene editing. They argue that while those technologies hold promise, messing with the building blocks of life could have unforeseen consequences. Like accidentally creating a superbug that wipes out humanity? Yeah, that's not great. Or even something we can't anticipate. The point is, there's a lot we don't know, and these sources are urging caution when it comes to tinkering with such powerful tools. So we've got ecological collapse, potentially man-made disasters. Yeah. But your sources also go full-on cosmic, right? Like, what's the deal with the sun trying to kill us all? I mean, I've seen that movie and it wasn't pretty. Right, the cosmic threats. Now, it's important to acknowledge that some of this veers into more speculative territory. But still fascinating. Hit me with the cosmic chaos. Okay, so let's start with solar flares. A big one could disrupt our magnetic field, fry electronics, and basically send us back to the Stone Age. No more Instagram. Now that's a disaster scenario. And then there's something called a grand solar minimum, which is a period of decreased solar activity. Sounds harmless enough. But historically, these minimums have coincided with global cooling, crop failures, and societal upheaval. So we're talking mini ice age on top of everything else. And some of these sources suggest we might be entering one soon. Fantastic. Anything else trying to kill us from space, or are we good there? Well, there's also this theory about a potential solar micronova, which is as bad as it sounds. But even more concerning is the fact that Earth's magnetic field, our natural shield against solar radiation, is weakening. Weaker shield, angrier sun. Not a great combo. Exactly. And because we're so reliant on technology, a big solar storm could cripple us, imagine. No communication, no transportation, no banking. It would be a cascade of failure. Okay, I officially have anxiety now. But I'm also seeing a theme here. It's not just the individual threats that are scary. It's that they all intersect and make each other worse. That's exactly it. And that's why these sources are so focused on building resilience, on understanding these vulnerabilities, and taking steps to mitigate them. So it's not about giving up hope. It's about being prepared. Exactly. It's about empowering yourself with knowledge and skills, both practical and mental, so you can navigate whatever the future throws at us. Okay, I can get on board with that. So less hiding in a bunker more let's learn how to adapt and thrive even if the world goes a little bit haywire now you're getting it and that's what we'll explore as we dive deeper into these sources okay so we've laid out the potential for let's just say it a pretty wild ride ahead but knowing is only half the battle right these sources talk a lot about building resilience but what does that actually look like where do we even start well the good news is your sources offer a pretty comprehensive roadmap and it all starts with the fundamentals shelter water food makes sense gotta cover the basics right exactly you can't worry about ai taking over if you haven't figured out dinner true that so let's break it down shelter first we've touched on relocating but what about the nuts and bolts of a resilient dwelling what should people be thinking about there it really depends on a few things your location resources the specific threats you're most concerned about got a structurally sound place in a decent area reinforcing what you have might be enough you mean like reinforcing walls hurricane proofing that kind of thing yeah exactly think uh -huh. strengthening roofs maybe adding a safe room or a basement shelter if that's feasible okay but what about those of us who don't own or, like me, live in a city that seems like a prime target for basically every disaster movie ever. Should I be looking at real estate in rural Wyoming yet? Well, relocating is a recurring theme in these sources, especially moving away from densely populated areas and towards more self-sufficient communities. So there's something to those off-grid communes after all. Maybe. But even if you can't escape to a fortified bunker in the wilderness, you can still adapt. Look, the key is to identify what makes your current situation vulnerable and then brainstorm ways to mitigate those weaknesses. So it's less about finding the perfect location and more about making the best of what you've got, right? Exactly. It's about taking control and making smart choices. Even small changes can make a big difference. All right, that's reassuring. Okay, so we've got shelter somewhat sorted. What about water? I mean, you can't exactly stockpile enough bottled water for the apocalypse, can you? Right, that's where sustainability comes in. Your sources are all about identifying potential water sources wherever you are. Think naturally occurring springs, wells, or even setting yourself up to collect rainwater. Rainwater. Isn't that kind of complicated it can be but there are ways to do it effectively and hey some sources even get into diy well digging okay now that's hardcore but finding water is one thing making sure it's actually safe to drink is a whole other challenge yeah absolutely water purification is critical boiling is the most basic method but there are also diy filters commercially available purifiers even solar disinfection methods wow who knew there were so many ways to make water drinkable <laughs> taking notes over here uh, okay clean water check 
Which brings us to the most important part, at least for me, food. Because, apocalypse or not, a girl's gotta eat. And your sources couldn't agree more. Food sovereignty, being able to produce and preserve your own food, is a major recurring theme. So, less ordering takeout and more. Learning to actually cook. Cooking, definitely, but also gardening. These sources go deep on different techniques. Permaculture, companion planting, crop rotation, you name it. Okay, I have to admit, I'm more of a buy my herbs at the grocery store kind of gal. But I get it, growing your own food equals independence. Exactly. And for those with limited space, there's vertical gardening, indoor hydroponics. Some sources even advocate for things like raising chickens or rabbits for meat. So I might be adding chicken coop construction to my to-do list. But seriously, what about people who live in apartments or have zero outdoor space? Don't worry, there are options. That's where learning about food preservation becomes crucial. These sources really emphasize the importance of canning, drying, fermenting those age-old methods of making food last longer. Like pickling. My grandma used to make the best pickles. Maybe I should have paid more attention. So it sounds like the message here is even if you can't grow it all yourself, you can extend the shelf life of what you can get your hands on. Precisely. It's about maximizing your resources and minimizing waste. Makes sense. Okay, so we've covered the basics. Shelter, water, food. We're well on our way to becoming apocalypse ready. Well, not quite. Remember those interconnected threats we talked about? These sources are pretty clear that a societal collapse wouldn't just be about empty grocery stores. It could impact everything. Right, things like energy grids going down, communication networks going dark. Basically, everything we rely on in our modern world suddenly disappearing. Exactly. Which is why they stress the importance of learning to live off-grid, at least to some extent. Okay, less scrolling Instagram. More. What... What exactly does off-grid living entail? It's about finding ways to meet your needs without relying on external systems. A big part of that is generating your own power. So solar panels on every rooftop. Solar is great, but there's also wind power, micro-hydro systems if you've got access to moving water. It's about diversifying your energy sources and reducing your dependence on the grid. Okay, I'm picturing a charming rustic cabin, a vegetable garden out back, a water wheel powering the lights. Honestly, not the worst way to live. Right. And the key takeaway here isn't that you need to go full-on mountain man tomorrow. It's about taking steps now to reduce your reliance on the system. Maybe start by learning about alternative energy, try conserving more in your daily life, or even invest in some basic off-grid equipment. Baby steps to self-sufficiency. I like it. Mm -hmm. But let's be real for a sec. No matter how many solar panels I install or how many cans of beans I hoard, if things really hit the fan, I'm going to need to know how to defend myself right now. Yeah, that's a very real concern, and it's not something these sources shy away from. In fact, they dedicate a significant amount of time to the potential for conflict in a world where resources are scarce and social order has broken down. So less ecotopia, more oh, Mad Max. Let's hope not. But being prepared for that possibility is important. These sources advocate for what they call a layered approach to security, starting with awareness. You mean being aware of your surroundings, potential threats, like basic street smarts. Exactly. But also, knowing how to de-escalate a situation, securing your home, learning basic self-defense techniques. Some sources even talk about firearms, but always with an emphasis on responsible ownership and use as a last resort. Right, because the last thing anyone needs is a bunch of trigger-happy doomsday preppers running around. Precisely. Community-based security is also often more effective than just going solo, things like neighborhood watch programs, learning conflict resolution skills. It's about working together to create a safer environment for everyone. So it's not about becoming some kind of lone wolf survivalist. It's about remembering that we're all in this together. Community is key. Exactly. Because when it comes to facing a potential collapse, we're stronger together. And that actually leads into another crucial aspect of resilience that your sources emphasize the power of community and connection right because prepping and survival skills are one thing but what about the human element we're social creatures after all okay so we've got shelter water food even self-defense it's a lot to think about but i already feel slightly more prepared just knowing this stuff but you're right these sources aren't just about practical skills there's a whole other layer to this whole resilience thing isn't there so we've covered the practical stuff the prepping the skills you know basically how to become off-grid homesteaders but these sources go a bit deeper too right they keep mentioning this inner resilience thing and the importance of community what's that all about like are we talking apocalypse yoga and group therapy sessions in our bunkers now it's not quite that literal though hey those aren't bad ideas it's more about recognizing that facing a potential societal collapse it's not just about physical survival our mental and emotional well-being is just as important i mean like our sanity I mean, I've seen enough post-apocalyptic movies to know that things can get pretty bleak out there. Yeah, exactly. These sources argue that holding on to our humanity, our sense of purpose, that's just as crucial as stockpiling supplies. They talk about finding strength in personal beliefs. So whether it's religion, spirituality, a connection to nature... Whatever resonates with you, whatever gives your life meaning. Because when things get tough, those inner resources become incredibly important. Okay, that makes sense. But they also emphasize community. Right. And not just in the practical sense of, like, having more hands to help out. Right, it's deeper than that. It's about shared purpose, mutual support, hope. Humans are social creatures. We're hardwired for connection. It's like, if the world as we know it is ending... I at least want to be surrounded by people I actually like. Exactly. It makes the whole thing a bit more bearable, right? Sharing stories, laughter, a sense of belonging. Those things matter. Big time. So it's not just about surviving. It's about figuring out how to actually live. Yeah. Even if the world goes sideways. Exactly. And your sources, they even highlight the importance of art, music, storytelling. Even in a post-collapse world, those things would be vital. Really? Why? Think about it. They're how we connect, how we find beauty, how we remind ourselves what it means to be human. They nourish our souls. So even if everything goes to hell, we should still hold on to those things that make us feel human. Absolutely. It's a reminder that even in the face of uncertainty, there's always room for hope, for creativity, for connection. Those things, they're not going to disappear overnight, no matter how bad things get. I like that. So as we wrap up this pretty intense, but also really thought-provoking deep dive, what's the one thing you want to leave our listeners with? What should they be thinking about? The future isn't set in stone. It's being shaped right now by the choices we all make. Prepare for uncertainty, yes, but don't let fear paralyze you.